Hello everyone, this is another video about driving in China. This is myself driving in uh, cities and Chinese highways. And this footage from the dash cam I have in the windshield of the car. Sorry, no, it's not the windshield, it's in the mirror, which is attached to the windshield of the car. And then I edit this at home, so I put the voiceover back at home, because I don't really concentrate at driving if I'm talking. So, in this video I'm doing the contrary to the previous one, so I'm doing the same path in the in the other sense. I'm going to from Hangzhou to Suzhou, and this is not during a national holiday. This um, this is on a Saturday morning. You see the date is 8th of May 2021, but this special Saturday, this is a working Saturday. There are like one or two working Saturdays in the year in China, and this is to compensate for all the national holidays that all into the week and to expand a bit more the long holiday so people can travel back home they took some extra day and then they put this in some saturday so this is one of these working saturdays so the traffic that you see in the roads must be representative of a regular working day and now i mean the video started in the liuxi elevated road and here you see some mitsubishi soup bothering me so the video started in the Louis Elevated Road, then I took the right hand turn into the S14. So now I'm in the S14 towards the toll, which will give me access to the highway. So this is limited at 80 km per hour, and we have two entries from the right hand side. That's why I get to the left lane now to allow that track I see in the other side of the barrier to to enter and in about one kilometer there is the exit of the s14 through the toll, bu toll bus and then we'll join the g25 which is the ring highway of hangzhou and you see here the magnificent buildings of hangzhou all these are res residential buildings so all this is homes Here there are several radars, you see some in the top of this tunnel. I know because uh, in the GPS I, got, I get all the indications. The positions of all radars in China are public, so the GPS can legally um, tell you that there is a radar, it's not illegal. And I think around here there is another radar of 80 km per hour, and then there is this exit, which I will take now. And here there are always tracks making reverse, because I don't know, I guess they take this exit and for some reason then they want to get out not sure if it's because they took this exit by mistake or because when they go to pay the toll bus there is some problem with the with their paying method but it's almost always i find these trucks going backwards here okay so once we overtake these trucks park here and you just saw that there was a truck that came out from the inside and joined the main road. So this is the exit 166 to the G2504. I said G25, but well, the G25 is subdivided by little parts like 01, 02, 03, 04. This is the 04. This is limited to 20 km per hour. And just when we arrive at the toll bus, I will jump 10 seconds to avoid disclosing my plate number for legal reasons. Here I'm like at one millimeter of each side. Okay. So I'm going to the ETC, which is the automatic bank paying method. And now I will jump 10 seconds to the future. So we already passed the toll bus and we are already joining the G2504. You see in the left hand side, this magnificent elevated road. I'm not sure if it's a train lane or road with this moving cast this is absolutely absolutely magnificent and this is the previous friend that i met in the s14 the mitsubishi that bothered me when he joined the way did you notice he just joined the way and instead of staying to the in the right lane he went to the left lane it's it's like crazy okay so this is a bit congested but this is normal i mean the G25 will always be congested. In addition, it's limited to 100 km per hour, so 
it's not really highway speed. So here I switched to the sport mode, not really in the car, but in my brain. And I will start to do some slalom to gain some track positions, because otherwise you just stay forever behind some left lane, left lane hawks like this Mitsubishi. You see the right side is the rubbish truck. This is for the waste. So here there is recycling. Like there are like four different bins, like the plastics, I don't know, paper, glass, and waste, something like that. The grey one is the waste. Uh, I wanted to comment about in the previous video I I got a comment by the user John Con. I'm not sure I pronounced it well. He said that automatic gearboxes does and doesn't have clutches. Well, this is wrong. You need some mechanisms to to separate the movement from the engine to the wheel train. So, either a clutch or something like a power converter, which is a kind of turbine filled with a fluid that can transmit uh, torque. But you need some kind of device that deacoplates engine from wheel train. The car I'm driving here is an Audi A3 limousine with a 35 TFSI petrol engine, 150 horsepower, with the seven gearbox, seven gearbox uh, dual clutch transmission. So this is an automatic gearbox which can be uh, operated with the levers in the driving wheel or with the with the shift uh, lever but otherwise it acts automatically it doesn't mean it's really an automatic in the sense in the US it's meant to be like I think in the US what is called automatic is particularly a car with a power converter but then there is this interesting technology that the Audi Volkswagen Group released I think it was in the year 2003 and the first car, I think it was a Volkswagen Golf, but I'm not really sure. But I'm pretty sure it was the year 2003. They released the first automatic gearbox with dual, dual clutch technology, which it's just mind blowing how it works. So instead of using a torque converter, which is basically a turbine with a fluid that is all the time transmitting torque, that's why when you are stopped in a traffic light and you release the feet, the foot from the brake, the car starts to to cripple a bit. This is because actually there is always torque being transmitted, and when you apply more when you apply more revs to the engine, it will change the config configuration of the fluid inside this turbine, which is the power converter, and we and it will increase the power, and then you will accelerate. But it's a system in which you cannot really 100% separate the torque from the engine from the driving. Uh, train. In this sense, John Cohn was right. Automatic gearboxes attached to a power converter do not have clutch, like a mechanical clutch, which is a metallic disc that wraps against another metallic disc to transmit the torque. But in this particular case, in this car with the dual clutch transmission, how it works is you have the shaft that comes from the engine and then in the drive tr drive train there are two shafts in the gearbox so these are the output shafts okay so one shaft has the even gears and the other one has the uh, odd gears so one shaft has one three five seven the one one the other one has the gears two uh, four six this allows for much faster uh, Gear shifts. Uh, gear shifts. How does it work? The car predicts, or the controlling system of this gearbox predicts which will be the next gear you will engage. Let's imagine, in this image here, I might, I may be at seventh gear, which is the highest. So let's imagine I'm a bit slower, maybe at 50, 50 per hour, and I'm with fifth gear. If the car detects that I have been accelerating at a constant rate from zero to 50. It may predict that the next gear I will need is sixth, so it's the next from fifth. So the gearbox already engages the 
six gear while the torque is transmitted through the fifth still through the fifth gear and then at the moment the controlling system determines that it's optimal to change gear it will just switch the two clutches one clutch is attached to the even gears the other one to the odd gears so it just attaches the clutch which is uh, uh, linked to the fifth gear and immediately at, uh, engages the other one actually it's not immediately like zero seconds because you need to rev match the engine the engine has some inertia and we, when you change gears this the speed of the engine will change so you need some time to accommodate this speed this can be either with a blip of the throttle which is electronically controlled in, a, in downshifts or you just wait a few uh, milliseconds for the upshift to for the engine to match the the correct speed and this is how a double clutch transmission works in theory it can make uh, shifts in seven milliseconds of course this is limited by the engine uh, inertia so in reality is a bit higher and why i said it needs to predict the it needs to predict the next gear you you want to engage but it needs to predict because actually there are two possibilities let's say we are in fifth gear we could go to sixth or to fourth gear so what happens like if i'm at 50 km per hour and i'm mm, accelerating at a constant rate and the car thinks the next gear i will engage is the sixth but at that moment i see a spot like i want to pass a truck really fast and i floor the throttle then the car will say, okay, the driver needs full power, so what we need to do is to reduce gears. But the gear that was engaged, because previous to th mm, flo flooring the throttle, it was the sixth gear, the prediction, but actually it's the fourth. So it needs to re-engage, I'm oh, sorry, de-engage the fifth and engage the fourth. No, the sixth and the fourth, right? And this makes the this kind of gearbox is a bit slower when you do things that are not predictable by the car like a really fast change of your attitude like you are just cruising and then you floor the pedal the car will take some time to reduce the gear but sometimes it's still very fast it can be like it's less than one second for sure i don't know exactly how much maybe half second but it's not the lightning fast seven milliseconds so this is the only downfall of these dual clutch transmissions now you could say, eh, why you don't make a triple clutch? <laughs> yeah, but the problem is that you add complication and weight every time you add an extra external output shaft. But apart from these hesitating moments, when you do something the car didn't expect, the, this gearbox is really fast, really, really fast. You really don't feel the changes because there is very small gap of time without torque being applied to the wheels. Okay, so this was the little note on car technology and now we are exiting the S, no, sorry, we are exiting the G2504 and we will join the S13. So I guess this is already the S13, at the moment we just derived from the G25, we were already at the S13. Here I'm trying to fight with some little trucks in the left lane. Now I will, I will try to get some track positions, gas, and here an average zone starts, it means the speed is controlled in average for, uh, I think it's 9 kilometers from this point. So this is not a big problem, because as you will see, I will be limited more by cars than with the actual limitation itself. Like at this moment, when you have two cars in parallel, what can you do? This soup breaking down in the left lane plus a Tesla Model S in the right lane. Okay, I will try to to get in front of the Tesla to see if I get a spot in front of the Mitsubishi. By the way, it's the same Mitsubishi as the beginning. Oh my god, I really want to get rid of this guy. I'm not going until Suzhou with this guy in front of me. And I'm sorry not to have the rear view now. But I messed up with the dashcam and I lost the images of the rear view for 
for this trip in particular. So I have more footage that I will maybe edit later, and that one has the rear view. So sorry about that. So here I'm slightly above the legal limits, but because this is a long average speed limit, uh, I can be faster for a while because I was for for a long time at less than 120 behind the Mitsubishi. So here we are really gaining some time. The track is totally clean, we don't see even anything in the horizon. And we are almost outside Hanzhou already, we see some urbanizations in urbanizations in the surrounding. But you see these homes are like three stories, more or less. So this is more like a village, it's not really like a city. This, this home usually belong to one family. So you, it's not really like one flat per family, it's people have some terrain. And here terrain is not as expensive as in the city. Like those tall buildings you saw when we were in the G2504, one apartment in those buildings can be between half million US and one million US. These are Hangzhou prices. And more or less the surface is 80, 80 square meters. So the prices are, are quite high. The, the real estate prices have been growing for many years now and they are really high now. But it's not, it's not even the highest in China. In Shanghai and Beijing, you can have even higher prices per square meter. So here, another left lane hawk. Sorry about the clipping of the dashcam. I already told you in the previous video, but that's why I'm. That's one of the reasons why I'm editing this this voice of at home. It's because if I talk in the car, it's inaudible because the microphone is clipping all the time. I guess it's because of the vibration. It comes from the windshield. I'm not really sure. So I edited, cutting all the frequencies below 400 hertz and everything above 3 kilohertz. And then I mix in OBS with a compressor in the video audio, which compresses depending on my voice. So when I talk, the video audio will be decreased maybe by 10 or 20 dB. And when there is silence, yeah, you get this nasty clipping sound. So I'm working on some fix for this, but for the moment I didn't find a solution. Okay, and we are still in the S13. The average velocity until now it's quite okay, but here we see some people not very civilized annoying me. I mean, they see some car approaching at 120 and it's not a problem for them to get in the left lane at 80 per hour. It's really not a problem. They just they just do it. They know you will you will break. And here I can press the throttle again. Let's see what are the panels in the top. I could not read. I just saw the speed limitation, which is which is 120 for both lanes. Recently, in this highway, there was an accident. This is recorded in the 8th of May, and I think it was three days before. So, no, sorry, there was the holiday of 1st of May, which is a big holiday, and I think it was the 2nd or 3rd of May. So, five days before this recording, there was an accident, and I think in this footage, we'll pass the, the place where the accident happened, so I will show you. There was a truck transporting some steel beams. Now here I'm using the horn for the car in front, but he's insensitive to my horn. And there was this truck with the, these big steel beams that I guess are used for the some building lower storage because they were really big beams. And the car was braking, I guess, and the beam just slid over the top of the truck and fell over the cars in front of the truck, killing six people. The, the beam was so heavy that 
testimonials say the car were like paper after the beam smashed them. So, yeah, pretty dangerous. And and it seems that it was because the beam was not well attached or because it was the track was overloaded. So there was one more beam of the actual maximum number of beams this track could transport. And wow, wow, wow. Okay. I'm really afraid of these platforms because the height of the platform is really my neck. So if you hit one of these tracks, like nothing will save you. Not the windshield, not the eye rack, no, nothing. It will chop your head off. So when I'm passing one of these tracks or some track doesn't maneuver like this one, I'm really afraid. Because I can still break on time, but imagine there is someone behind me, like these stupid left lane hogs that they don't break when they need to break and they smash me against the track. So when I do something like this, I'm always looking at the rear mirror. In case there is someone coming at high speed, I will just lower my head, like put it between my legs or something. Okay, so a bit of traffic jam here, I think because there is an exit to the right hand side and it creates a bit of jam but nothing alarming before i was talking about the dual clutch transmissions i want to add some something about these dual clutches actually I have almost zero experience with automatic gearboxes. I never tried a park converter. I just drove two cars with automatic gearboxes and the two are with a dual clutch. So one is this one, this Audi A3. And the other one is a Porsche Cayman from my friend. By the way, he's a quite famous YouTuber. I will not disclose his name at the time. And he already sold this. Cayman, but he let me drive it for 10 kilometers or something and it was equipped with the PDK Porsche dual clutch transmission which is very similar to the Audi Volkswagen one. Of course it's tuned for much faster changes because it's a more sporty car but it's essentially the same so two odd, odd shafts that each one has one uh, clutch attached to it and it predicts the next gear you will engage so it makes much faster shifts so what i wanted to say it's some feature that it's implemented in these cars that at the beginning i was quite annoyed by them and you know in park converters as i said because they are always transmitting torque when you release the foot from the brake the car will start to cripple automatically it will start to move a bit and then you just press the throttle and you continue accelerating. So this is the way usually it works in the traffic lights. So you release the foot of the throttle, the car starts to move and then you accelerate and it continues to accelerate. Dual clutch doesn't work like that, naturally. I mean, unless there is some electronics that tells the, the gearbox to, to, to move the clutch, the clutch will not transmit any torque so naturally as they are built when you release the foot from the brake nothing will happen but it seems that they wanted to make an automatic transmission that is easy to use for people who already know to use an automatic car with a park converter so what they did is to implement some control some yeah some control program in the gearbox that imitates the behavior of a park converter so when you release the brake the car starts to move this is very unnatural for me because knowing what is the technology inside the gearbox the first time i tried a car with a dual clutch transmission i was like but why it moves i mean i'm not accelerating why the car interprets that i want to move and it just to imitate park converters so at the beginning it was very annoying for me because i don't like the car taking decisions for me i want to know what's technology behind my feet and yeah I, I found I found this was very dangerous because actually imagine 
it's the first time you drive one of these cars and you have zero experience with automatics. You release the feet from the brake and the car starts to move. Your sub subconsciousness can think, if the car is moving, it's because I'm, my foot is on the throttle. So automatically, what can happen is that, like by instinct, you change the pedal and you press the other one. So you thinking that you are going to brake, you press the throttle and then you will cause an accident. And this, I think, is a very common thing. As you see in the news very often, like someone bought a new car and I don't know, crash it while parking it, something like that. I really think it's because of this behavior, which is very anti contraintuitive for people who never tried it before. So this having been said that I'm quite against this technology, when you get used to it, I have to say it saves it saves you a lot of time in the traffic light because the time that it takes you to move the feet from the brake to the throttle, which is not a, a lot of time, right? It can be one second, maybe, but it's one second you gain because the time you are releasing the the brake, the car is already disengaging or engaging the, the clutch. So because the car is already moving slowly but already moving, it means you can already press harder in the clutch without like uh, creating a like creating a high acceleration or a not pleasing movement inside the cabin of the car. So at the beginning I really disliked but yeah I got used to it and now I feel I'm much faster in in traffic jams and in city traffic with this feature. Okay, here a bit more difficult again to pass this track. Maybe I will try to get to overtake this little van using the right lane, but it doesn't look like. Come on, come on, accelerate. The problem here is that, that people, not all of the drivers, but maybe half of them just stay in the left lane because they find it more comfortable. So they can do 100 kilometers without looking at the mirrors. They just stay in the left, constant speed, and that's it. Okay, that's not right, but uh, I could bear with it. The problem is, let's say they are comfortable with a velocity of 100 km per hour. Okay, it's not the speed design speed, uh, sorry, not the way design speed, but it's still okay. I could bear with it. But the problem is that when they want to overtake a truck, overtake a truck, they reduce the speed drastically. Like if they add 100, they reduce it to 80. It's like they don't really look at the tachymeter, but they look at their environment, how fast the objects surround them move. So if there are cars at, at 100 km per hour, they, they, they will keep moving at 100 km per hour. If there is a track at 80, like they don't feel good if they pass the track too fast with a 20 km per hour difference. So subconsciously, they reduce the speed to match the one of the track which is the worst thing you can do because you create a traffic jam be behind you and because you stay more time in the dangerous place, which is close to tracks. What you should do is to keep constant speed and pass the track. And if possible, pre press the throttle while passing the track so you are less time near the dangerous item. But I guess this takes a long time, training. and Even if you start training your young people with this kind of behavior when this when these procedures oh and look at this guy i was in full acceleration and he just changed lane without even using the indicators oh my god so even if you start training people now when they get to the highway and no one is behaving in the correct way they will adapt their behavior to the rest of the people. So the problem of difficult solution, unless you take everyone, 
like 100 percent of drivers and reeducate all that this, all of them at the same time it's a really a difficult task to change this behavior because because it's already institutionalized in the society and i'm sure most of people doesn't know that they are doing anything wrong they think it's totally fine and they don't realize that behind them people is stuck and they cannot advance at a normal speed I discuss this with some colleagues. Like they usually ask me, "How do I feel about I don't know Chinese food or or Chinese life?" Or so someday arrive the question, How, "What do you think about Chinese highways?" And usually I have very good opinion about everything, like about the economy, the option, the opportunities to to get a job, to change job. The, I really like the food also, so they were used to me always saying good things and then they asked me about the highway and I said the infrastructure is very good, nothing to say about that, pavement is very smooth, the covering of highways is it's all China basically so you can go everywhere using highways and most of them are three lanes, some two lanes. But, and then I said the but, and their, ch their faces changed a bit already. And I said, but the users of the highways don't let to use the full potential of these infrastructures. And they were really not pleased with this answer, my friends. And I tried to explain that you cannot use the left lane unless you are overtaking a car. And they disagreed with that. They really disagreed and said, but if you are at the maximum speed, then you are entitled to be in the left lane. I said, no, it's not the way it works. Even if you think you are in the nominal speed, which is never the case because the tachymeter always shows more than the actual speed, you are not entitled to be in the left lane. You are only entitled to you use the left lane to overtake. This is the way it works. And this is how you get fluid highways. So my friends or my colleagues, Really, they don't have any bad intention and they, they don't even realize they do something wrong. But because it's the way they learn, they think it's like that. So it's a very difficult thing to change. And I watched several videos of driving in the US. I've never been in the US, but I think in the US is not that extreme, the low discipline, the low left lane discipline, but it's quite low actually, the left lane discipline. I think the best place to drive in highways is in Euro is Europe and in particular the north of Europe. Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Germany. I've drove I drove in these countries and it's significant significantly better than the south, like Spain. And it's the best I've seen in the world. It's the most civilized. So if there is someone from the US watching this, please tell me your opinion. Because I'm just saying things, uh, I have the impression from videos I watch in YouTube, but I never drove in U the US, so I cannot really talk about this. So, how is the left lane discipline in the US? Okay, so we are, we are still in the G, no, S13. And I think very soon we will take the derivation to S12. So at that, at that point I will end the video and the next footage already has uh, the rear view. Sorry for this video not having the rear view. To say in this trip I was quite afraid of trucks. Usually I know they are dangerous but I don't think too much about it. But because this trip was five days after that accident that basically smashed six people, I was looking at the cargo of the trucks all the time to see if it was well attached or something. Here passing some soup.
some little van. Change to the left lane. Gas. And this horn is not me. This horn is the dice cam that detects the the lane assist. It's the lane assist that if it interprets that you are drifting without actually intentionally changing lane, it it beeps. And here we have uh, two white cars in parallel. The right one is a Tesla Model 3. The left one, I don't know. And uh, Tesla is braking. Maybe he wants to regenerate the battery or something. No, he was just braking because in front he had a Mercedes taking the exit. Mercedes C-Class. And now we can overtake this car which looks like a um, Citroen. And then we can overtake this vehicle, electric vehicle which apparently he doesn't want to use too much energy, so he's just staying at 100 km per hour. That's fine. And here we are, we are not too far from the exit. We are approaching the S12. Let's see how many track positions we can gain before reaching the S12. But probably here I will lose some time. I will lose a few seconds here. I have to say I like when these little vans don't have the membrane in the windows because I can see through so I see what's in the other side and it allows me to do this kind of maneuvers because I already saw from the through his windows that the next track was quite far away. Here membranes are quite popular almost every car uh, has a membrane in all the windows and the law here is different than Europe, you can have dark membrane even in the front windows. The windshield is limited at, uh, I think it's 80% transmittance or 70, I'm not sure. In the car I'm driving now, it's 15% transmittance in all the windows except the windshield, which has, uh, I think it's 80. The name of the membrane in the front is a Lumar Air 80, which is a bit bluish. So it's almost transparent, but it has a bit of blue tone. And all the others are Lumar, I think they are called Lumar 15, because the transmittance is 15%, so they are quite dark. From the outside, you, you don't see me. Like if someone looks through the passenger or pilot windows, they will not see almost anything inside. Okay, nice, we gained some track positions. And here the track is quite clean. So we're gaining some time. In this morning of a working Saturday. So compared with the other day, you see some more tracks and many less cars. So this how a holiday and a working day compares in Chinese highways. Very nice, no left lane hogs. Here I'm using the cruise control. Always when there is no, oh no, I cannot believe. So here I need to slam on the brakes, wasting a lot of energy. But I mean, the highway is very clean. He saw through the mirror there was a car approaching quite fast. Why he cannot wait? Okay, go back to nominal velocity. I'm using cruise control, as I said, when there are no many obstacles, I always use cruise control. It minimizes travel time without surpassing the legal speed at any time. So I don't even reduce speed, speed when I go through a radar. I usually fix the cruise control at 125, which is GPS speed of exactly 120. So even if there is some tolerance with the radars, I could set the speed maybe a 5 or 7 km higher. But that's fine for me because setting it higher with this kind of track, changing lane without looking in the mirrors, it's a bit, well, 
I don't want to be too fast with these conditions. Here, yeah, a track overtaking another track. Let's see what that cargo. The left one seems it's carrying some boxes. Probably those are to be sold in Taobao. And the left one is carrying like some bath sinks, aluminium cast, I don't know. Okay, gas. Just a reminder, um, we are still in the S13. S13, two-lane highway. Approaching the exit to the S12. Going towards Suzhou. We are already in Jiangsu province. We already crossed the border, I think. Oh, no, no, sorry. No, no. I think we are still in Jiangsu. I'm pretty sure we're still in Jiangsu province because this accident I told you happened in Jiangsu and we didn't reach the place of the accident yet. Okay, quite clean highway here. Maybe some trucks will join after this intersection. We'll see. And another thing I wanted to comment. Like three weeks ago, there were three leopards that escaped a kind of zoo in Hangzhou, so in my city and they only found two so that's quite i'm quite worried about that because i go to work by walk and even if i work in the urban environment you know having a leopard walking around who didn't probably didn't eat a lot during the last three weeks makes me a bit worried but it seems that the last track they have they have from the leopard is in the mountains so it's not really in the urban area of Hangzhou. It's like in the forest and so on. But yeah, so there is a leopard going around. But it's a bit suspicious that three weeks after there is no even signs of him. So maybe he died of, because of no food or who knows. Someone hunted the leopard and has his head in the living room like a trophy. It seems that this uh, zoo, which is attached like to a pharmaceutical company or a medical company, I'm not really sure. And this company makes uh, research with animals. So they basically they kill animals to, to test some new drugs or some new procedures. But a way, I'm not sure if say clean their image or I don't know. It's not like the activity is illegal. The, the experiment, experiments with animals are common in all the world for science and to find new drugs. But it seems there is some relation between their experiments and this zoo. I'm not sure if the same animals that are displayed in the zoo are the ones that afterwards will be using the experiments or what. But I'm checking, maybe it's here the accident I told you. Yeah, yeah, here is uh, where the accident happened. So we are very close to the derivation to the S12. And here you will see the scientific police investigating. And if you look at the floor, you will see some marks. Probably where here, here where there is a group of people. Here, exactly here. You see those marks are the beam that fell from the truck. And it was so heavy that not only, not only smash a car and kill six people, but only left a very deep marks in the asphalt. So I guess because there is this derivation during the holiday, there was some traffic jam of cars getting to this derivation I'm getting now. The truck found the traffic jam after being at higher speed and slam on the brakes and the higher beam in the top of the cargo that was not well attached slide over the truck, falling over the cars in front of the truck. So pretty horrible accident, I guess. I'm not sure. I think the scientific police still needs to study the case, but I guess the, the truck was overloaded uh, or not using the correct safety measures. So uh, as I said, this leopard that escaped, um, 
we escape from Azure, which is the property of a pharmaceutical co uh, company, which uh, experiments with animals. So it seems there is some relation between this zoo and the animals they experiment with. But this zoo is open to kids and family and so on, so you can really go there and just to pass the day. And meanwhile, I'm trying to overtake this jaguar. It seems an F type. Oh no, sorry, it's an X XF, not an F type. And no one knows why, but the company didn't tell the authorities when the three, when the three leopards escaped. So they just released this information one week ago, but the leopards have been three weeks around. So I think they tried to catch the leopards, and when two weeks uh, passed and they could only catch two out of the three, they said, okay, let's let's call the authorities because there is a leopard around. So now there is still one leopard around, and I don't know what will happen with this company. Probably, will, probably they will get some sanctions, someone will, someone will need to pay for this annoyance that they created. So we just joined the S12. This is the last highway that it's needed to be taken to reach Suzhou. And I will end this video here. There is still some minutes more of footage, but it's almost one hour of video, I think. So I have more footage to show you, more interesting uh, driving experiences. And there is even one accident. I will check if I can show it to you or not, because if they are played numbers, maybe for legal reasons it's better I don't display it in YouTube. But there was an accident in Suzhou inside a tunnel in which I was not really involved, but let's say I was at three cars distance from the accident which was behind me, and I saw it through the mirror. And uh, yeah, maybe I will see if there are no played numbers involved, I may also play this footage. And I also have more tech to discuss, like uh, dual clutch gearboxes, turbo engines, or different driving modes, or the start-stop system, or the polymer coating, engine mm, block, no, engine block, no, engine cylinders, etc. I have a lot of interesting subjects to talk about. There is also a very interesting subject, is the Tesla lawsuit, lawsuit in China, in which a woman uh, went to the court against Tesla. It's a bit complicated case, so I will leave it for the next video. It's a really interesting case because there is TV, mm, there are TV channels, government, Tesla, this woman, it's a very crazy case. So, thank you very much for watching. Don't hesitate to put uh, any questions you have in the comments below. See you in the next video. Bye.